What's going on, guys? My name's Corey Komori, and welcome to Lyric Breakdowns here on the Breakdown Channel. And as you guys have probably noticed by now, I have a special guest with me today, Mr. John Conway. What's up, guys? John, thank you so much for coming in and guest starring on this uh, video with me, because I know that you pretty much are the resident expert of Opeth. Well, I don't know about that, but... Uh, oh, like... no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm going to put it out there. He is. He is. Trust right. me. Okay. Yeah, maybe a little bit. So uh, with this video today, we are going to be discussing and analyzing Ghost of Perdition, which is by Opeth. Um, in this song, the way that I interpret it, it seems to be a song that um, is pretty simplistic in nature. It's a song that is about possession, possibly demonic possession, possibly just talking about spirits and is an overall ghost story. And I'm going to be arguing... Uh, Corey's point by saying that although Ghost of Perdition is a masterpiece and one of my favorite songs off of my absolute favorite Opeth album, that there is no meaning behind it. So I guess with that, we should probably just jump straight into the song. So we begin the song with the words, Ghost of Perdition? Mother. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Ghost of Mother, Lingering Death, Ghost on Mother's Bed. Black strands on the pillow, contours of her health, twisted face upon the head, ghost of perdition, stuck in her chest, a warning no one read, tragic friendship, called inside the fog, pouring venom, brew, deceiving. Beautiful. So uh, again, with that particular section there, it really sets up the scene, in my opinion, uh, for a traditional ghost story, not something that's like paranormal activity or anything like that, but something that is more along the lines of a traditional gothic horror or ghost story. You know, we have these lines talking about this woman who is in the throes of a an exorcist, it seems. And the lyrics are very, very visual in that they really are trying to set this scene up for the listener. I mean, mm -hmm. the moment you hear, you know, the you know, ghost on mother's bed, black strands on the pillow, contours of her health. You know, you see her hair is all matted. She is just right. like being destroyed by the uh, the nature of this act. And from there, it kind of just continues to bring you in that, you know, she's pulled into the fog of, uh, of this possession and the demons that are trying to pull her in there. Um, you know, again, for me... I I don't even think that this song is necessarily trying to be super uh, deep and layered from a um, topic standpoint and having multiple meanings. I think it's pretty straightforward in that it's trying to set up a narrative. It's trying to be almost like a film or a play. I always pictured this as being the perfect song for a play. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would absolutely love to see a Broadway version of this song come to life. Um, and at the same time, it's a song that is, you know, so it's trying to set up that feeling, that mood like a film would. Um, but it's also tapping into the psychological aspect of what these characters may be going through, which I'll touch upon later in the song. Um, do you have any thoughts jumping straight into this? Yeah, I mean, I agree with what you're saying that it does paint a very vivid picture. Um, I think one thing Michael's been really great at doing is by showing off his uh, kind of intellectual side with the English language. Um, I mean, he just like the words that he uses, you would never guess that, um, you know, English was, you know, his second language. Um, Absolutely. Being from Sweden. So I do agree. Yes, you can you can picture this uh, this corpse almost lying on the bed. And once, you know, you dive into actually reading the lyrics, the, the, the way that he talks about the hair. But, you know, from where it goes from here, this is where I think it kind of, you know, you've got this picture of it. Well, is it an exorcism? Is it a murder that just happened? Is it, you know, I think it's kind of ambiguous. And I think this is where a lot of people will try to create, you know, some sort of character and uh, kind of run with the story here. Um, but I think that this is just an example of just um, some dark uh, poetry. Uh, it's definitely dark and it definitely is poetic. And, and I would completely agree with, um, with your assessment of his ability to utilize the English language. It is staggering to me. Yeah, you know, I'm. It's I, just I, stupid. I don't. How good I, he is at it. I'm. I need like a thesaurus whenever I'm looking through these words. Exactly. Exactly. It made me want to quit writing lyrics altogether because I was just like, I, English is my first and only language, really. <laughs> and this guy is able to trump me in every aspect. But at the same time, it is also very. Um, 
inspiring as well because it's like, wow, look at look at what you can do with just a handful of words and as far as setting up things. Even right. if, you know, what I'm saying is, oh, the song is about this conceptually, and you're saying it just gives off a vibe, mm-hmm. I, I think it's successful no matter what. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's dark, it's brutal, which is awesome. Totally metal. Absolutely. And it, evil. It is the textbook definition of of metal, in my opinion. So with that said, uh, we're moving on through the song. In the next um, section of the song, we hear the words... Devil crack the earthly shelf. When I say now, you guys are going to head back without music, and that's what we want to see. One, two, three, now. Foretold she was the one, blew hope into the room, and said you have to live before you die. Devil crack the earthly shelf. Foretold she was the one, blew hope into the room, and said you have to live before you die young. <laughs> It's forever. It's forever. It's yes. on the internet. It's forever. <laughs> We're keeping that take. Man, <laughs> always wanted to do that. I know. And now that you've done it, it's just it feels good. All right, we're done here, right? Yeah. We, <laughs> um, so we have that section there, and then we continue on through the verse uh, with the words, holding her down, channeling darkness, hemlock for the gods, fading resistance, draining the weakness, penetrating inner light. See, I, th- I think this is a good example, too. I think that it's a coincidence that these words also go with kind of that first verse. Like, I think this is his best example of pairing up some really nice sounding words that do have that evil kind of feeling to it. But I mean, what is what is he even talking about? You know, I mean, well, again, for me, it feels like uh, it's a continuation of the um, this the first part. You know, for me, it seems like it really is an exorcism of some kind. Um, you know, especially when it's talking about the the devil cracked the earthly shell. You know, foretold she was the one. So it's like basically that part for me says this person, the earthly shell is her, the body mm-hmm. that she inhabits, and the devil finally broke through that. It cracked that and. You know, foretold she was the one touches on something that happens later in the song. There's a lyric that really kind of accentuates that. So what makes you think it's not uh, the devil cracking the the man's shell, getting through to him, possessing him to have killed his mother? You see what I'm saying? Like, uh, Well, no, I could see that, too. I could see that, too. But at the same time, um, I guess the reason why I think it's her that's being possessed or her shell is the one that's being cracked is that the last two lines where it says, you know, blew hope into the room and said, you have to live before you die young. It's this other voice and presence speaking through her. Mm-hmm. Doesn't that make you want to, like, go out and do something? Like, you have to live before you die young. Well, man. no, like, yeah, you know, yeah, it definitely does. I always does. thought that was kind of out of place because this was the first, let me tangent for a second, the sure. first Opeth album that I, the first release that I got to buy from day one. And I remember listening to this and that that harmony with that devil crack the earthly shell part is such a you know they don't typically go major like they ha- like they do now but you know up until Ghost Reverie is like that harmony I remember it sounded really weird and just listen to that you have to live before you die you know, like I always thought that was a little uh, a little cheesy so maybe you can put the the dark uh, evil uh, concept on it for me since I'm just you know failing to see it. I- I'm also the guy that loves Coheed and Cambria <laughs> where you know they're talking That's about all sorts of fucked up evil shit and at the same time it sounds like a pop punk song it's so a Coheed part. I guess. Yeah yeah that's why for me it didn't take away that meaning or that vibe it still was just like oh this is what he's talking about they just happened to go major because you know the song itself called for it but I think what's interesting too not to go too far on a tangent but this album, a lot of people say that this is the album that really started to change Opeth's sound. Mm. And for the longest time, I, I always thought, uh, I think it's Watershed, but you really do hear the the beginnings of yeah. that here. Well, and now that we have, you know, what, how many, three albums now? Four albums from this one? Mm-hmm. Um, you can see that this is where they really <laughs> laid the groundwork by bringing in... Um, pair on the keys um you know he was a full-time member now uh for this album and then this was also um it's kind of weird because if this is the one where it started the shift well they brought in a whole new drummer um martin lopez left and axe kind of joined it so when i actually saw them on this tour I, i never got to see martin lopez so i never even i don't even know if he toured this album with the 
with his drum parts. But um, I guess you could definitely say this is where it, where it transformed. Um, but that's that's why I love it. I mean, I think that this is a a good bridge album between kind of the '70s prog throwback that they've been doing and the stuff they've done before. Um, I would agree with that. Um, so yeah, moving forward through the song, uh, we then transition to the section. Uh, again, where we hear those beautiful, beautiful, soulful vocals and harmonies, you know, with the road into the dark, unaware, winding ever. Mm. Nailed it. it. Yeah, that it will never happen again. <laughs> um, you know, and then it gets into that section where it starts Man, to break down again. Musically, one of my favorite Opeth moments. I mean, I think that it just doesn't get any more opethy than this little acoustic interlude and <laughs> i remembered the only thing i wanted to do was get on the internet and find tabs and play it and it was in an open tuning i had no idea what that was and uh <laughs> so you know i i love this interlude and i'm curious to hear your interpretation for how it fits in with this this concept i mean i've always just thought of it as a nice airy ethereal spacey um kind of, you know, just this beautiful music passage with him with those soaring falsetto kind of vocals and then the harmony and then when that solo comes in, you know, I'm a guitar player, so of course I'm going to, you might hear me just talk about the music and how that makes me feel. That's I have he's to, been brought in to I give have extra to at, perspective. I got to look at these lyrics because I don't, I don't typically listen to lyrics, so, but I think that, um, you know, I was trying to think of how this would fit in with the concept and perhaps, I mean, because it's kind of like it, right in the middle of the song, so is I kind of would see the song as uh, this is like is he feeling, is, is it the spirit doing something uh, with this kind of ethereal part? Um, yeah, that that section for, you know, the road into the dark unaware, winding ever higher. Right. Um, it's interesting because the way that I interpret it is it sounds like this person who was possessed was dabbling in like black magic or the occult, which kind of, opened up the gates and made it easier for her to become possessed. So, you know, she was messing around with things and unaware of the consequences of that. And it's like the the staircase just continued to spiral as she continued to dabble in it, and it just became more vast and overwhelming. And then again, you know, it gets into what I think is probably one of my, if not my favorite sections of the song with the darkness by her right. side. Spoken passerby, you know, and then the dedicated hunter. <laughs> right, because it's not live. It's not live. <laughs> Waits to pull us under, rose up to Do its it call. In his arm she'd fall, mother light received, <laughs> faithful <laughs> servants free. So, Again, there, it's like she was a faithful servant to the occult. She was dabbling in it. She started to express interest in it. And then this vessel was going to free her in a certain way. You, you know, know, I'm actually, you've enlightened me on this, but I've really missed my old misheard lyrics for this song. So I remember being in the car asking you, is it faithful servants flee or faith will set us free? Well, it's funny because I, I thought it was the I thought it was the latter yeah, for I, the longest time. Well, so I'm imagining, like, <clears throat> even you know, and still, don't I'm I'm, I'm not on board with the, the concept thing, but I guess you know I always bringing him over. <laughs> I always imagine a servant like running away because this ghost has come in or something. You I know, did like, too. <laughs> so um, good. I'm glad I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Um, but but that's kind of what I that's what I envision when I'm hearing that section there. And and, and what's interesting is the parts that we touched upon prior. Um, you know, really talking about the seeds that were planted initially really get touched upon in this next section here because, you know, we had the whole um, the devil cracked the earthly shell part and at the same time that um, the draining, the weakness, penetrating inner light and the road into the dark unaware, mm -hmm. you know, this part here, you know, initially, you know, I was saying, oh, it's about this woman started dabbling in this shit, and that's why she became the perfect vessel for so, this evil. So what part? What are you talking about? So the part that I'm talking about that suggests that was the road into the dark unaware. She she started dabbling with black magic, started messing with the occult, and that what's, that's one of the things that made her an easy vessel. But then we get into the next section, which is 
in time the hissing of her sanity fade out her voice and soiled her name like mark pages in a diary everything seemed clean that is unstained double pages in a diary what's that i always thought it was like double pages in a diary like they're stuck together no it's mark pages in a diary um and then it goes into the uh the incoherent talk of ordinary days why would we really need to live decide what is clear and what's within a haze what you should take and what to give ghost of perdition a saint's premonitions unclear keeper of holy hordes keeper of holy whores i was really hoping you were going to growl ghost of perdition keeper of holy whores um but that section right there, it kind of opens this song up for me even more so because now it seems like, okay, it was preordained that she was to be consumed by this evil as you know she was trying to, maybe it sounds like she was trying to maintain her inner self and she was trying to find ways to do that through other means like black magic. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it also this section here also implies that maybe... Maybe there is no possession, like real possession that's going on. Maybe this is all in her head. You know, it's, you know, it seems like she was unstable from the beginning and there were events that ostracized her in her community. She had, she she sounds like somebody who suffered from mental health issues Mm -hmm. and was ostracized by her community, her family, and then just slowly but surely fell down that rabbit hole. And maybe that's what made her easier to be possessed or whatever by the devil or whatever you want to call it. Uh, But maybe it's nothing like that at all. Maybe it's just this person is just mentally unsound. And this is a story about a family struggling with this person who is mentally unstable. You know, especially that in time, the hissing of her sanity faded out her voice and soiled her name. It Mm -hmm. sounds like the the whole entire community said, this bitch is crazy. Right. We can't fucking deal with her. Maybe it's just some random awesome lyrics too that he's put together because he brought stay it with back. me. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard him live. This song is called In My Time of Need. The lyrics, total bullshit. They don't mean anything. And you go back and you're sitting there looking at his lyrics. Man, that was a pretty you know good what? impression of Mr. Eckerfeld. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, he really can make something sound meaningful. I love it. I mean, it's my favorite band, Opeth. But I'm still not. I mean, I, I really appreciated your your passion with getting in, into it with that uh, that stanza right there. So, um, I don't know. Let's keep going. Yeah. So uh, let's keep moving. Uh, so then the next I, part. Well, I still think. What if it's about the the, the son though? Because well, ghost the thing. of why does he say ghost of a mother's. Bed, well, right? isn't that what he says? So, like the way w- that I the way I interpret that is, this is recalling the the events that led to her death, and yes, the song is from the perspective of the son watching his mother go through all of these things. Okay. So it brings it back. It's in a non-linear um, format, mm-hmm. and it brings it back all the way to here's the possession. And then now we're going back in time talking about the way that the community said, this bitch is crazy. Get her out of here. We don't want to deal with her. And he watched the the slow but um, sure descent into madness with Mm -hmm. this woman. All right. I can buy that. You know, and it starts to set it up from this is the perspective of the son watching all this stuff happen because it doesn't seem like it's something that is from the perspective of the mother. Okay. So then I may be getting ahead of myself and uh, reaching outside of this song. But so... For those that don't know, this album was speculated to be a concept album. Um, they initially were shooting and, for it to be, and then and because of the last track, "Isolation Years," doesn't really fit. Um, they kind of kept everything else, but scrapped the concept. So, something else that has been called into question is the uh, the chronological order of the songs. You know, does it make sense to start with "Ghost to Perdition" when you know uh, the second to last track? Grand Conjuration. Is it second to last? Third to last? Second to last? I think it's second I'd to have last. to look it up, but keep think, talking I and I will. I think I'm right. Uh, you know, that uh, Conjuring the Devil uh, himself, is that the mother doing it? Is it out of order? Did they have it maybe in a different order when they were planning on the concept? Is that what is throwing everything off? Is the fact that they're starting with the song 
but if she's it already is the used second this, to last song, sorry uh, to cut you off. No, I love being cut off when I'm, you know, when, when uh, you're right. Confirm that I'm correct. Yeah, <laughs> so that's fine. So I, I don't know. I just, um, isn't the summoning part, like, isn't Grand Conjuration, isn't that basically what that one's about? I know we're. we're I believe so, but okay. that would be an entirely different video <laughs> so since I mostly did research on this one. So. Um, that would be my assumption. But yes. isn't the rest of the album is the sun? He's running, right? Are we gonna get? Are you gonna bring it home and get to why he's uh, has left his uh, poor mother? As far as getting into Bang of Hounds or getting towards the getting end of this song, this song. Yes, we are gonna get into the end Good. of it with this song. So as we continue on throughout the song, we hear the words to see a beloved son in despair of what's to come. If one cut the source of the flow, and everything would change. Would conviction fall in the shadow of the righteous, the phantasm of your mind might be calling you to go, defying the forgotten morals where the victim is the prey. So again, I, for me, that just brings it home that, yeah, it's from the perspective of the son watching this happen, and at the same time, Especially that very last line for me. But it's about this person that was already mentally unhinged and had a damaged psyche, and that's what made it so that these events took place. You know, she was she became victim and uh, and prey to those um, those difficulties. Right? Does it say to see a beloved son or her beloved son? To he's, see he's got a that, beloved son. He's got that kind of accent on uh, her, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I can I can definitely see that. So but. how is it from the son's perspective to see a beloved son? I mean, that's clearly like third person. Well, that's that. Yeah, that's more. That's more from yeah a third person perspective of like someone so like that, us watching the events happen. Um, but again, I I think that because he's even mentioned in it, it really he's a pivotal character in this role here. And again, everything else seems like it's from his perspective, watching all of these things transpire, whether it's the exorcism or his mother losing her her, or her him mind, killing, or, or him killing his mother, or possibly him killing her and him being the reason why she he's died during the exorcism. I don't know because I've always you know he could be possessed. Very well, it could very well be that. And that's why we have these videos, so that we can have discussions about this stuff. Because what I may interpret, someone else may interpret it completely differently. You're wrong, Corey. <laughs> yes, th that, that's normally how the internet boils it down. <laughs> <laughs> Just watch my other videos. <laughs> but that's, that's the way that I see this. And um, I don't know what you have to add as far as that's concerned. I've got one more thing. Sure. What is a ghost of perdition? Well, it's a ghost of damnation. Perdition is, you know, damnation or hell. It is, you know, torment. Man, I was really so hoping. Uh, I did my research. I really I, I, it's funny that I, I love that word, perdition. It's just one of my favorite words. And then at the same time, they use another word in this song that I never really hear, hemlock. I was like. Oh. I love Dude, hemlock. Come on, you should have let me guess because I was literally going to say hemlock. Well, because hemlock is just, I mean, it, for me, that one word in that section right there. It's interesting because it, it, the way I perceive hemlock, it's like a concoction or a poisonous concoction of various like elements or herbs, we'll call it. But in this case, elements. It, she was a perfect concoction for these evil gods to just go and inhabit. Do you think he like, you know, obviously when you go back in their catalog, the the words, the lyrics are even more, I think, poetic. Um, you know, you listen to some of the stuff off Orchid, Morning Rise. I mean, the stuff is just like, as he would quote, black metal nonsense, the lyrics. But I wonder if he like had this, I don't know. You, you know, when you go in like your um, relative's house or something, you go in like a closet that nobody's been into, he finds some kind of like awesome English words that nobody uses. And he just like started writing lyrics with these. Like, and it's got like, a, you know, he's finally at like perdition and hemlock, you know, using these. Like, that's the secret. It's like the anthrax so. effect where like <laughs> Scott Ian and just looked up a word in his biology book and it was like, ooh, that's a cool word. I yeah, guess I we'll mean, use that. Well, it's just like how, I mean, you know, we talked about this earlier, just his, his command of the English language. Like, what if he just had like this, this awesome book that just had all these cool words in it? That's the secret to, to the lyrics, you know? Maybe. I don't know. But what do you guys think? Did we leave anything out with our discussion? Do you have anything to add to the discussion? Do you think that this song leans more on a narrative side? Or or do you think it's just uh, 
a masterpiece that is randomly put together to sound dark and evil, but it's totally awesome. Either way, please leave a comment below and let us know. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, please give us a subscribe and a thumbs up. We'd love to do more discussion-based videos like this. Especially about Opeth. Yes, especially about Opeth. So with that being said, I've been Corey Kamori. I'm John Conway. Thank you guys so much, and we'll see you next time. No.